Nicola has written uh, about uh, the most of the background we're talking about today, about Gundi Salinas, about roast tests. Uh, and today in his capacity, perhaps, as the secretary of the Roger Bacon Society, he's going to tell us something about Roger Bacon's views. Thank you, Rega. So let's share again my screen. And well, it's going to be different a, from what we've just seen with Aquinas, as you can imagine. So, but. It, it, in analyzing Roger Bacon's idomorphism and particularly his theory of matter, uh, one should appreciate how his stances are grounded on the intertwining of Bacon's varied interests. However, the proper taste of Bacon idomorphism is given by the two levels of physical and metaphysical examinations of the universe. Although Bacon's attention is mostly focused on natural philosophy, he neatly distinguishes between the idomorphism studied by physics and the idomorphism treated by metaphysics. It was very common in the Middle Ages, but Bacon's attitude appears to lean more on the natural philosophy side of the equation, seemingly amending his metaphysics in order to make it fit with physics. In my talk today, I want to assess the application of Bacon's amended idomorphism to different cases of ontological constitution. I will first present the central tenets of Bacon's idomorphism, discussing the main claims that he often repeats in his later works. Second, I will focus on the application of Bacon's idomorphism to the natural world, and particularly to the cases of mixtures and elements. Finally, I will move on to Bacon's discussion of prime matter and its functions and draw some conclusions. So, broadly speaking, three main features mark Bacon's ontology. He is a universal idomorphist, believing that all created substances, body, souls, and angels alike, are made of matter and form. He is also a formal pluralist, maintaining that in every compound there is a plurality of substantial forms of which only the last one is in act. Finally, he is a radical realist, claiming that in every compound there are two lines of ontological constitution, of which one is individual, the other universal. These theories are not specific of Bacon's thought and were shared by other 13th century philosophers, usually Franciscans. From their acceptance, however, Bacon derives three more specific doctrines that are the more, quite more characteristic of his idomorphism. The first of these meaningful tenets is focused on the theory of substantial change. I'm not referring here to one of Bacon's most radical stances, the theory claiming that generation and corruption happen over time, but to a central claim very often repeated by Aristotle that generation and corruption happen between opposite species of the same genus. For Bacon, this assertion carries out an axiomatic function for each and every process of substantial change. While discussing uh, the elements in the opus minus, Bacon even refers to it as the universal law of generation. While in this specific passage, Bacon refers to Aristotle's generation and corruption, his line of reasoning is very close to metaphysics lambda 2 and eta 5. In lambda 2, Aristotle stresses that the process of change always happens between opposite or their intermediate and requires a matter common to both, which persists. In turn, in eta 5, Aristotle famously discusses the relationship between matter and contraries through the cases of healthy and sick bodies and wine and vinegar. There, he maintains that ch the change of one into another passes necessarily through the matter, implicitly considered as the genus of both contraries. Indeed, matter is the potency of both positive and negative contraries, although the latter only by privation. Hence, Aristotle observes that the substantial change of wine into vinegar passes through a reduction of the terminus aquo into its matter, that is, water. Acknowledgement of this fact leads Bacon to a second consequential claim. If generation happens along these lines, the potency of wine to become vinegar is not expressed by a metaphysical entity, but a physical one, 
namely the proximate matter of both wine and vinegar. In this case too, Bacon is not claiming something uncommon. Most medieval thinkers distinguished between proximate and metaphysical matter. And again, Bacon could easily find the same stance in Aristotle's metaphysics. For instance, at Theta 7, it is said that the potency of a compound is its proximate matter. As for Bacon, this claim is connected to the main outcome of the universal law of generation. The enduring substrate of substantial change is proximate matter, which holds a genus function for both the terminus a quo and the terminus at quem. Hence, the matter carrying out the potency function and the substrate function in generation and corruption is not the materia pura, as Bacon calls it, but the proximate physical and composite matter. This point made things difficult for Bacon. If it is a composite matter that performs the potency function, how can the form alone be in the terminus of the process of substantial change? In this case, Bacon clarifies again Aristotle's words, stressing that the terminus at quem is not the form. Indeed, form stands for the suppositum of the terminus at quem, and substantial change always starts and ends with a substance, not a form. The terminus at quem only expresses a function of the form. It is actualized and corresponds to the completion of motion. When matter means the principium materiale, it expresses both the generic substract and potency of both the terminus at quo and the terminus at quem, and it is a compound whose metaphysical matter and form are in potency. When form means principium formale, it is not a metaphysical form, but the real act and culmination of the process of substantial change, that is, a substance. Clearly, in this context, matter and form merely stand for potency and act as defining features of the natural world in constant change. Yet Bacon does maintain that there are also proper or metaphysical forms and matters. Any created substance is indeed a compound of metaphysical matter and metaphysical form. However, as we have seen, every substance itself also has physical layers of proximate matters which are potential substances made of metaphysical matters and metaphysical forms. This is the third tenet of Bacon's holomorphism, which is a consequence of a radical interpretation of what we have seen until now. Indeed, Bacon adheres to what I've called the principle of perfect holomorphic correspondence, claiming that each and every specific substantial form composing a suppositum needs to be joined to a corresponding specific matter. Considering Bacon's formal pluralism, this means that a plurality of substantial forms implies a plurality of specific matters, one and one for each layer of the ontological constitution of substances. In other words, Bacon proposes a radical interpretation of the common claim that a bodily form needs a matter up to it. Such claim is extended in scope. All forms need a matter up to them, not only bodily forms. And the claim is also applied to each and every form that are in a compound according to the plurality of substantial forms. Each of these forms must have its own metaphysical matter. The outcome of Bacon's interpretation is a very generous ontology. His realism implies a reification of an adapted version of the Porphyrian tree shaped by Imgabirol's Pons Vitae. The branches of this Porphyrian tree correspond to substantial layers of more specific and more general existence nested into the most general of all genera, the common matter of everything. Yet, since every layer is a substance, it must be hylomorphically constituted in itself. It must have its own specific form and specific matter, which are structured in their own Porphyrian trees, stemming from the first form and prime matter, respectively. A visual example of this state of affair is given by Bacon himself in his Communia Naturalium, where he details the six trees that you can see in the diagrams included in his work. According to Bacon, the core of ilomorphism is not the couple of matter and form, but the modal pair of potency and act. The consistency of physical and metaphysical ilomorphism is given by the modal functionality of its terms physical matter as the potency of the compound and metaphysical matter as the potency of the form. In this case too, Bacon's main line of reasoning is rather common in medieval philosophy, yet it is its application that gives some different outcomes. A central 
feature of Aristotelian nature is the claim that complex bodies are made of uniform bodies, and these are somewhat constituted by elements. Uniform bodies are mixtures that can be divided over and over into pieces of the same kind of that body. From this point arises the vexata question about how mixtures and elements are related. Mixtures are made of elements and can be reduced to the elements, yet the mixture is not the elements because the elements are not integral parts of the mixture, which otherwise would be an aggregate instead of a uniform body. Hence, how can the mixture be reduced to the elements, preserve some of their qualities and not be in turn composed of them? Attempts to answer this question have marked much of the history of, of Aristotelian natural philosophy from Alexander of Aphrodisias uh, onwards. I will not delve into such fascinating history, which has been studied by Anneliese Meyer and more recently Franz de As, among others. Similarly, I won't treat the problem of how elemental qualities are preserved into the mixture, although it's one of the most fascinating features of Bacon's theory. Let me focus instead on the forms of the elements to which these qualities are causally related. Concerning this specific problem, Bacon makes two slightly different claims, at least terminologically. In the Opus Minus, Bacon discusses the causation of the mixture and claims that the forms of the elements are corrupted by the agent into their own common matter. The mixture is then induced from there and nothing of the nature of the elements endures. In turn, in the Communia Naturalium, Bacon discusses about elemental transmutation and argues that the miscibles are reduced into their substances and that the qualitative remission follows such substantial remission. In this case, Bacon is not referring to the forms but to the elements as substances. It is the elements with their forms and matters that are remitted modally into their potencies. One may ask whether Bacon is claiming that the forms of the elements are corrupted or that the elements are remitted. Complete remission and corruption into the common matter are basically indicating the same thing for Bacon, since it takes generation and corruption to be gradual and happening over time. In both the Communia Naturalium and the Opus Minus, the same process is described. The four elements are taken back into their common matter. This matter is not prime matter. Matter here does not mean metaphysical matter, but a compound. Indeed, we know already that any generation corresponds to the passage from one species to its opposite or middle term, and their matter is common to both as their genus and potency. The matter of the elements is called by Bacon natural matter, and it is the substrate of sublunary physical beings. For the same universal law of generation, elements and mixtures are for Bacon opposed species of the same genus. They can change into each other only because they are opposed species. Hence, the generation of mixtures passes through two phases. The reduction of the elements into natural matter by, by virtue of an agent and the adduction of the mixture from the potency of natural matter. Two orders of problems arise from this position. First, how are the elements related to the mixture if they are a different species of the same genus? Bacon replies by recurring to the causal history of the mixture. Basically, God created the elements first and their causal interactions produced the mixture. Accordingly, the elements can either be considered grosso modo as the matter of the mixture, especially in consideration of the common natural matter and its potency. The second problem is far more difficult to address. How can the mixture be reduced from natural matter and what aspects of it are reduced if natural matter is a compound of low potency? According to Bacon, three things are reduced from natural matter. The mixture, its metaphysical form, and its metaphysical matter. They proceed from the potency of the mixture, which is, which is triple, the potency of the whole compound, the potency of its form, and the potency of its matter. Indeed, any process of generation leads to the causation of a new substance, hence also of its constituents. Otherwise, Bacon observes, generation would not be the causation of a new substance, but a new form. Hence, when a new substance is caused, 
its specific form and specific matter are caused as well. But how is that? Bacon's answer relies on the functional correlation between matter and prohibition. Any matter, either physical or metaphysical, is intrinsically connected to prohibition. Prohibition is presented by Bacon as the deprived essence of matter. It is proper to matter's potency, which, as we've seen, is the main functional feature of matter, both as a compound and as ingredients. For Bacon, prohibition is an active potency because it expresses the desire of matter to be actualized, that is specified into one of its species. It goes as far as to say that according to this active potency, both natural matter and prime matter, that is both compounded and metaphysical matters, have a desiderative essential act, although they are in potency. Being natural matter a functional matter, its privation and potency are reflected into all of its components. In other words, Bacon claims that privation as active potency toward actualization and specification is proper to natural matter, its metaphysical matter, and its metaphysical form. Indeed, all three are in potency, and all three desire to be specified and actualized into one of their species. In the case of natural matter, which is the stuff of which the sublunary word is made, these three active potencies are called by Bacon the three hidden virtues of natural matter. The three hidden virtues are also identified with and functionally, functionally expanded to the seminal reasons of the Augustinian tradition. Therefore, the agent adducing the mixture from natural matter brings it forth from the active potency of the compounded matter, its form and its proper matter. The result of this tripal act of adduction is again tripal, the mixture, its form and its matter. This is how substantial change happens in the sublunary world, and Bacon dedicates many pages to the discussion of this problem. Yet the universe is not limited to the sublunary world. As we have seen, natural matter is the substrate of physical generation and corruption, and it is a compound. As such, it is metaphysically constituted of its own metaphysical form and matter, and it proceeds from a more remote generic and compounded matter of which it is a specification. Such generic matter is called corporeal matter and is common to all bodies. Yet there are two main kinds of bodies, corruptible sublunary bodies and incorruptible celestial bodies. Consequently, we have to assume that their compounded matter is common to both and that they are opposite species of the same genus. Above all these layers stands the most general of all genera, which is basically the simplest, most general stuff common to all created beings. It coincides with the notion of created substance as such. Being far away from any processes of generation and corruption, the genus generalissimum has been created by God and its being is the union of the first form and prime matter. In it, prime matter is utterly completed by the first form, although the potency of matter gives rise to its specification into the series of potencies, or specific matter, sorry, and below it. And the same is true for the first form, which is in act towards prime matter, but in potency toward all other forms below it, which stemmed from the first form as formal filiation into genera and species. And it is also true of the genus generalissimum, whose specification leads to the complex and rich universe we see in all. Roger Bacon is frugal in his discussion of prime matter. Most of its functions are analogical to what we have seen regarding compounded matter. It is important in itself as a tendency toward its specifications and always needs a form of the same kind in order to produce a substance. For the details are scattered in Bacon's mature works and are not always coherent with each other. The point that Bacon discusses the most is the impossibility of the unity of metaphysical matter against those who claim that substantial forms can only join prime matter. Bacon even elaborates a series of mathematical demonstrations about this. Additional sources we have to the additional sources we have can help us to gain more insights about Bacon's theory of prime matter 
and these sources are basically the early commentaries on Aristotle written in the 1240s when Bacon was a master of arts in Paris. However, Bacon appears to have changed his mind on some aspects of idomorphism over time. For these reasons, we should take Bacon's earliest stances with a grain of salt. Yet they can help us appreciate what were the concerns that fashioned Bacon's approach to idomorphism from such an early stage. The questions on metaphysics offer a description of prime matter which was quite standard at the time. Prime matter has a maximally diminished being with no actuality whatsoever apart from having an essence which provides it with some degree of positivity. Not having any contrary, prime matter has only a receptive potency and no passive potency, which is proper to natural matter only. As for the function that metaphysical matter carries out, it is mostly the substrate of instantiation of forms, which are multiplied into metaphysical matter, although the latter is one per essence. Finally, in his questions of met on metaphysics, Bacon accepts Averroes' doctrine of the undetermined dimension into prime matter. These dimensions would become physical dimension in the bodies while remaining unexpressed in the spiritual beings. It is unclear why Bacon accepted this doctrine, which would appear to be redundant once Bacon admits the commonality of corporeal matter as generic matter of both sublunary and superlunary bodies. Similar line of reasoning are offered by the questions on physics. The idea that quantity is genetically bound to prime matter is again presented, as well as Bacon's light motive against the unity of metaphysical matter. The latter can be known only by analogy to the form, although God has his own idea of prime matter which he, uh, by which he created it. In fact, metaphysical matter is in potency according to its being, but in act according to its essence. Finally, the function carried out by matter for the instantiation of forms is repeated in the questions on physics, pointing out that matter replicates itself into multiplicity. Uh, sorry, Neil, the replicates maybe is not the correct term. I should check before you, you're happy about this. Multiplicates itself into multiplicity remaining one by essence. I am not sure about how useful these doctrinal points can be to better understand Bacon's later ilomorphism. Clearly, since the years of his earlier commentaries in Paris, Bacon's attention is focused on some theoretical issues that would mark his later reflections. The most consequential of these points are his rejection of the doctrine of the unity of matter and his adherence to an, to an ontologized consideration of logical determinations. Yet, the way in which Bacon refers to matter in his commentaries, usually implying different meanings, and the concise, convoluted, and sometimes naive solutions that he gives to the central questions he is discussing make it rather difficult to assess what the continuities and ruptures with his later adomorphism are. And this leads me to my preliminary conclusions. We have seen some main aspects of Bacon's idomorphism. If we were to take and contrast them one by one, with the 13th century debate, probably none of them would appear as bizarre or perhaps strikingly original. From this point of view, even the doctrine of the specification of metaphysical matter is not so weird, especially if we consider the debate on the ontological constitution of super and sublunary matter. Yet it is the sum of all these stances and the radical way in which Bacon applies to them that is very original and even ingenious in its own way. His theory, assuming the presence of a plurality of matters and forms into the compound, does explain plainly how we have a physical matter which is in itself a compound with its own physical matter, but also its metaphysical constituents. His doctrine of the active potency does explain how privation manages to cause a new compound limiting natural transmutations to a set of possible outcomes nested on natural matter. And Bacon's claim that natural matter is the substrate of generation and corruption does explain in a clear way, natural and perhaps even artificial transmutations and mixtures. It is a universe in which everything tends to be specified to become a species specialissima, 
which corresponds to say that everything strives to be in act, to exist. And to exist primarily are substances, hylomorphic compounds, not their metaphysical principles that exist only within those substances. Therefore, claiming that these substances, either in act or struggling to be in act, are the true defining actors of our ontology might be naive, yet surely not banal. There is no need to point out that many interpretive problems are still open. How did Bacon envision the specification of prime matter without any recourse to the form? How can some theories that seem to be tailored for the non-living world be applied to living beings? And most importantly, how is this explanation of natural constitution compatible with Bacon's theory of the species detailed in the, in the Multiplicatione Specierum? Roger Bacon is often himself elusive, repeating the same point as if it were self-evident when it is not. He tends to be equivocal in his use of hylomorphic terminology, and his metaphysics needs to be reconstructed from his discussion of natural philosophy and the sciences. Considering Bacon in his broader context, it seems to me that much of his later hylomorphism can be read as an attempt to resolve some problems of doctrinal consistency presented by the Fonts Vitae while substantively harmonizing in Gabriel with Aristotle. From this point of view, stances like the specification of metaphysical matter into species of matter, the redundancy of Porphyry's tree as main explanatory table of ontology and natural philosophy, as well as the reduction of matter and form to model functionality, all address specific problems of coherence posited by the Fonts Vitae when contrasted with Aristotle. Evidently, in this context, the role played by prime matter may appear to be minimal. And surely minimal is the treatment that Bacon gives to this elusive entity. Yet its main function is foundational. Together with the first form, prime matter is the root of substance itself as component of the most general of all genera. As such, prime matter is present in everything in a unique way, which is far away from what we see and touch, yet nonetheless present in all metaphysical matters composing what we see and what is below it. Therefore, the function carried out by prime matter and the first form is the most important. They are the signs of our limited, composed, created existence, the main ontological feature that distinguishes creator and creation, foundation and derivation. Thank you.